staying so late for our talk. So uh, we are going to show some interesting use cases we are solving at Red Hat. And this is basically how we are leveraging AI, or rather deep learning, to enhance developer productivity and confidence, because that is one of our key themes or key goals. And slides and code are available. You can check it out on GitHub. And basically, we are from the Red Hat Developer Tools team. And I'll let my co-speaker introduce himself before I get started. Uh, hi, I'm Avishkar. I'm a data scientist in the Red Hat Developer Analytics team, along with Martin. Uh, so I don't want to say a lot of things about myself. But the one thing I do want to say is that all the code and the design documents and everything that you see in this particular talk, being Red Hat, everything over here is open source. So if you feel like this is something that you can use, if you feel like contributing to this stuff, uh, we will set up sources. Please reach out to us, and we'll be happy to work with you. And I'll let it continue. So yeah, I'm also a data scientist working in the Red Hat Developer Tools analytics team. And we'll cover two interesting use cases here. The overall thing is we'll cover what is this dependency landscape all about, key objectives, business significance. And we'll talk about our deep learning models, what we are using. We'll try to go through some hands-on code so that you can see the kind of architecture we are using, kind of outputs we are getting. And we'll talk about the current results we have got and what are the next steps for us, right? So the main thing here is everyone here is uh, a developer, at least. Even if you're a data scientist, you are building or developing models, or you have been a developer, let's say, at some point in your life. And the thing is, we don't code everything from scratch. We don't code neural network models from scratch. We leverage reusable components or libraries, right? And that's the thing about dependencies. They are all these open source frameworks out there where people have kind of worked hard on building these frameworks and making all these cool features available for us, which we can integrate into our own applications, let's say enterprise applications, and then build these applications with ease so that we don't reinvent the wheel, right? And these are examples of dependencies like leveraging Google Cloud, uh, deep learning, and so on. Now, if you look at the dependency landscape, there are so many options out there, right? With every year as we go into the next year from the previous year, these number of dependencies are kind of exponentially increasing. Uh, the Node.js ecosystem is kind of the most popular one out there with JavaScript dependencies increasing exponentially, as you can see. And then you have Maven, which is the Java-based ecosystem. So all these dependencies are increasing exponentially, which means uh, more and more better features, more and more better libraries are being available to us. But it's also hard to do the due diligence of whether our code is secure, our code is safe, and so on, right? Because we are not the ones who are writing these libraries. We are the ones consuming them. So this is a case study on proactive security and vulnerability dependency analytics. And what is the security landscape like? So the security landscape, to understand that, we need to understand what are these vulnerabilities. Because uh, like even I am not from a security domain, to be honest. Like my domain is data science, right? But I'm working in this kind of a problem right now. And a lot of you may not be let's say, security savvy. So what are security vulnerabilities? They are basically bugs in source code so that, let's say, malicious uh, hackers or attackers can kind of exploit your system and gain access, right, unauthorized access. So commonly, they are termed as CVs, known as Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures. And there is actually an online database maintained by the US government known as NVD, National Vulnerability Database, where all the CVs are listed for each and every ecosystem. Like if you search for a TensorFlow, you will find that there is a CV ID because of some kind of malicious code which was, could be exploited because of some bug in the code. Some attacker could get in and exploit it. Similarly, for different third-party libraries which you guys are using, let's say, day in and day out, there could be potential vulnerabilities. And the idea is we don't want these to affect our enterprise applications, right? Because if it's a personal project, great. But if people are consuming our enterprise applications and these kind of vulnerabilities are there, it becomes a problem. And if you see these trends over the period of the last few years uh, with regard to all the major ecosystems around Maven, NPM, and Python, uh, the number of security vulnerabilities are also increasing because the number of dependencies are also increasing. And there was like a 43% increase in vulnerabilities in 2017 and a 33% increase in 2018. And the idea here is, uh, unfortunately, we are working a lot on the Golang ecosystem, which is this one, right? So the number of public vulnerabilities are often missed, because if people don't find out about a vulnerability and they don't disclose it publicly, 
it will never be published as a CVE, right? So that is becoming difficult for more complex ecosystems like Golang because it's not as straightforward as the other ecosystems. And this is the reason only 10% of uh, maintainers or let's say people who build these repositories or dependencies file a CV publicly. And because these vulnerabilities are not disclosed as CVs, what happens is if you are using these dependencies where a vulnerability exists but these are not reported, there is a real risk, right? Because people can hack your code and they can just, one of the most common vulnerabilities you all may have heard about is the SQL injection attacks, right? So similarly, there are so many other types of vulnerabilities which can really affect all your applications. And one of the other key limitations of the existing vulnerability analytics is that the time elapsed when a vulnerability, let's say, exists versus when it's disclosed. It's like huge. So between that time, a lot of damage can be done to your own enterprise. So what are the key objectives for us here? So we focus on Red Hat products and trying to keep them safe and secure. That is our go-to thing to kind of focus on. So uh, Red Hat has this product called OpenShift, which uses all the goodness from Kubernetes. And what you can do here is you can uh, build your applications, you can deploy them and monitor, maintain, and scale them at ease. Right, because it uses the power of Kubernetes. Hence, our focus is on the Golang, Kubernetes, and OpenShift ecosystem. That's like a total of almost 850 plus uh, direct and transitive dependencies. And if you kind of keep a pulse on the security news, you may have seen recently that almost a four month audit was done on the entire Kubernetes stack and 34 vulnerabilities recently cropped up. So that's like all these days people are using this and there were 34 serious vulnerabilities which could be exploited anytime. So that's the thing here. We want to kind of find these vulnerabilities proactively, even before they are publicly disclosed, so that we can integrate these findings into the developer processes and potentially engage with the developer community out there to improve our models. So our key objectives, what did we do here? How did we solve this problem? We potentially built these deep learning models based on past historical data where we knew that some vulnerabilities happened versus when they didn't happen, let's say, depending on that kind of data. We'll talk about what is the data shortly. And what we are doing is we are kind of monitoring uh, all these uh, regular public activity going on in all these 850 plus repositories and dependencies, like let's say GitHub events around issues, pull requests, mailing list conversations, uh, bugs being filed online, all those aspects. And Using that public information, we are trying to predict probable vulnerabilities that, based on this kind of activity, maybe there is a probable vulnerability in, let's say, Golang, or let's say in Kubernetes. And obviously, we have to validate with the security experts because we are not security experts, right? So coming to the business significance, I already covered this, right? So let's say when a vulnerability is already present and by the time the fix comes out, the median time to potentially fix and put it out and publicly disclose it, or maybe sometimes they silently just fix it, right? It's like close to 886 days. So this is like really bad. A lot of damage can be done in like two years, right? And how we are leveraging our models to work is we are tapping into the public data because most of the time you will see that, let's say I'm a maintainer of uh, the request package in Python. I will have so many other things to do, but all these millions of people who are using my request library, they will know that if there is some kind of a bug or something is there, right, because they are using it day in and day out. So often publicly people will open issues or file pull requests or basically talk about bugs in mailing list conversations and so on. So we are kind of trying to tap into this data and also let's say if people are doing code reviews and other aspects. So we are trying to tap into all these public events and conversations around all these dependencies and feeding that to our models to make these predictions. So to summarize the business significance is basically Golang ecosystem is quite complex and as you know, you use PyPy or Conda for package management in Python. Similarly, Java has Maven and in Node.js we have NPM. In Go, you have some kind of ecosystems uh, of package management, but they are not as mature as all these ecosystems. And NVD feed for public CVs is incomplete. A significant number of vulnerabilities only get initiated after an issue or PR is filed. So people will not report these publicly a lot. You saw that graph right at the bottom, right? Golang is like the least uh, as compared to the other ecosystems. And we talked about the time lag of issue being reported versus publicly being filed. So what is the architecture we are using for our vulnerability detection? 
Uh, we focus on the OpenShift source code base, which is around 850 plus repositories or dependencies, let's say. Uh, and we tap into all this. We pull in GitHub events around issues, pull requests, commits. We pull in uh, things around mailing list conversations, uh, bugs, bugs being filed, and so on. And we will uh, have an events collector which pulls in all this data. And we'll store it in a data store. And now what happens is we have built some deep learning models, let's say, on historical data of past vulnerabilities which were found versus regular issues, pull requests, mailing list conversations, and so on. And what happens is all these new issues, pull requests, which are being filed, it goes through our first deep learning model. This is a bidirectional uh, gated recurrent unit uh, deep learning model with attention. Seems to work pretty well on text data because we are parsing all the text descriptions, right? with regard to issues, pull requests, commits, conversations. So these are all natural language data. So this is basically a deep learning on NLP problem. And then what happens is we are using our first model to go through all the source data and find out what are potentially uh, documents, in our case events around pull requests, issues, and so on what are potentially related to the security domain. Because people will file issues about other things also, right? Like some feature is not working, something else. So what are potentially related to security? That is what we first focus on in our first model. So it's like a binary classifier, right? Security versus non-security. We filter out all the non-security data. And then we pass in only security relevant events into our next model, which focuses on out of all these security related issues, what could probably lead to a vulnerability. So every security issue or whatever, commit or pull request or conversation being filed is not always leading to a vulnerability. Something could be like, okay, I'm putting in a security feature request or maybe I need to change my authorization technique. So everything is not about a vulnerability. So the second model is very tough to focus on because it's all related to security, but some are a subset of it which is vulnerability related. So our second model tries to take in all the security data and say, what is potentially a vulnerability. And then basically our final predictions go to the security team, they validate it, find out the false positives. Obviously there will be false positives, right? I mean, this is a tough problem. And then we will feed it back to our models uh, after doing a triaging and then retrain our model. So that is the pipeline we are following. And to summarize, regularly monitoring 850 plus repositories, extracting all the public data, filtering out security issues, using the filtered data to predict events which are about probable vulnerabilities and then triaging and improving our models. So deep learning model architecture, like I mentioned, uh, using pre-trained models for, well, let's say pre-trained embeddings, not pre-trained models. We are going into that in the future. Uh, using a stacked two-layer bidirectional GRU deep learning model, feeding in the GRU hidden states to a global attention layer and your regular fully connected dense layers to make the final prediction. So with regard to embedding layer, I think almost everyone here knows about embeddings. You have your text data, you map it to some numbers, and you start with some random initialization of weights for each word, and then with backpropagation, you try to improve all the embeddings. But we are not filling it with random weights. We are initializing with pre-trained embeddings. Many of you may have already used like glove, fast text, word to vec and so on. For us, it performed better than random initialization. So first we did random initialization, then we did it it performed better for us. And GRU is basically similar to an LSTM or an RNN model. So instead of the forget and the input gate for an LSTM, it uses a reset gate and an update gate, basically. And what happens here is uh, the update gate acts similar to the forget and input gate of the LSTM. It will decide what information to throw away also and what new information to add. And reset gate basically kind of focuses on what kind of past information should be retained. And it takes fewer tensor operations, dot products, and speedier to train than LSTMs. So what's the need for bidirectional GRUs? We could have used just GRUs. So the reason of this is to get better context. If you see these two sentences, if you go for the first three words, here it means beers, but here it actually means that uh, it's the precedent. So what if we go from front to back and also back to front? So I talked about this yesterday in my NLP workshop. The idea here is if you can put two LSTMs or two GRUs, one trains from front to back and back to front, concatenate the final hidden states, they will be able to preserve much better contextual information than just going from front to back. And what we do here is 
instead of sending out the last hidden state from the GRU, which typically happens, like in this case, let's say I have four GRUs, typically you will have the input going, the next hidden state goes into the next one and so on, and the final hidden state goes to a dense layer and you make the prediction. So instead of that, I take all my hidden states and I put it through a global attention model, and then I get a context vector which helps me focus on all these weights where if this is higher, maybe this word is more important. So that kind of an aspect. So we use an attention model where instead of using the output from the last GRU cell, we send the entire sequence of hidden states to the global attention layer, and then we get a final context vector which is a weighted average given by alpha into the hidden states. These hidden states, there are t time steps. In our case, instead of a time step, it's basically the words, right, sequence of words, because we are parsing descriptions, conversations, and so on. So there are just three simple equations here. The weights and biases are randomly initialized, obviously, for the attention model. With back propagation, it improves. You, for each time step or each sequence of the hidden state, you apply a nonlinearity after this regular uh, neuron equation, right, Wx plus b. Do a softmax to squeeze it between 0 to 1. And these alpha values kind of say which hidden state is more important so that the model can attend to those words, knowing that if these words are occurring, this is the outcome. That's it. And other models under development, we are definitely focusing on BERT right now. There are some nice results we have got, but it's still in experimental stage, hence we are not sharing it yet. But there seems to be some promise with the transformer-based architectures. And hands-on tutorial, we'll go through the code briefly before I move on to the final results which we obtained. So this code is available in our GitHub. All our code which we work on is even open sourced. Uh, you can even check that out later or feel free to reach out to us. We are even looking for people who can contribute and improve it over time. So we load the necessary dependencies here around uh, TensorFlow and text preprocessing and so on. Uh, obviously I'm not sharing the data here because it's huge. We are dumping it day in and day out. We load the events data from GitHub around issues, pull requests, commits and so on. All of this is text-based data. We do some text pre-processing here, trying to pre-process all the documents. And then as uh, you can see here, our data is highly imbalanced. So this was last three years worth of data. For Golang, it's much less. So we have around 22.5K potential issues, pull requests and so on, which are non-security related and only 671, which are Sorry, all of these are security related. 22.5K uh, are non-CV related and 671 are CV or vulnerability related. So huge class imbalance. What we do is we do a regular train test split and we take in our pre-trained word embeddings, right? By loading, first we create the word sequences with our regular tokenizer, create a length of 1,000 sequences, pad it as needed like you do in regular text. Uh, processing for deep learning. And then what we do is we load our pre-trained embeddings here. We focus on the fast text paragram and glove-based embeddings. And what we do here is we, I think here we used uh, fast text and paragram. So we load these 300 dimension, 2 million pre-trained vectors, right? And we get the vectors for our words and we average the embeddings. So we fill our embedding layer with these pre-trained embeddings. Uh, this kind of code is anyway available even online, like you don't even need to refer to this if you have used pre-trained embedding. So just populate our embedding matrix with these pre-trained weights. And like I said, instead of using just the last hidden state from the GRU layer, you focus on putting all the hidden states to the attention model. So this is the attention layer, and just briefly covering this, uh, EIJ is basically for each hidden step here. You are computing the WX plus B. Alpha is the softmax, but before the softmax, you do a tan h, as you can see here. Right, so those three equations is all that is happening here. And then you do a tan x by taking an exponent and then dividing it by sum of all the exponents. And hence, you get the context vector after that. So just simple math at the end of the day. And using this attention layer, plug it into the bidirectional GRU. So two layer stacked GRU, plug it to the attention layer, regular dense layers model is done, right? So using this model, we kind of build it on 75% data and test it on 25% test data. So as you can see here, this is great, right? 99% precision, we call F1 score, but that's not really of our interest. Our interest is this, because we want to catch all the vulnerabilities. So as you can see here, out of around 158 potential uh, uh, vulnerabilities, we were able to predict around 109 of them. So got a recall of close to 70%. So that is a nice baseline which we got. 
obviously we tried other models, machine learning didn't work at all. And uh, this is basically our model architecture, right? Which we are currently using day in and day out. And briefly to wrap it up, current results, uh, data set was focused on GitHub events data for last three years, our input data on which our models were trained and evaluated. As you saw, it was highly imbalanced, only 650 plus vulnerabilities, and these were our results. As you can see, 70% uh, recall of prob uh, probable vulnerabilities identified. So this kind of brings me to the end of our use case, and the next steps, like I said, working on transformer models, doing weekly scans, improving our models, and definitely engaging with the community, maybe, if you can provide us with better models and improve it for everyone. So now, we'll move on to the second use case. Yeah. Okay, okay fine. thanks for that, yeah. uh, So the second use case that I'm going to talk about, uh, as the Pandan mentioned, is previous use case around security. We are trying more on the side of security and product. So this use case that we target is a more public-facing use case, I would say. And uh, definitely more, the more notorious use case and its potential to kind of change the world and the way people do their code. So this is the developer productive debate of the productive game conference. Uh, so I'll briefly explain the use case over here. So if you remember the opening slides of uh, this particular presentation, you would remember that we talked about how developers at this point of time not really code everything by themselves, right? So then how do, what does the, the developer workflow technically look like right now? So a developer who's writing uh, oh. we'll just minimize it. Just go to that. That's okay. Uh, yeah. Just click on this one after. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, so a developer who is writing any kind of application right now, the way a typical development process starts is you have some particular objective in mind. And based on that particular objective, some dependencies that you have built. So let's say you're building a machine learning model, you already know that, okay, I have to build a recommendation system. Uh, TensorFlow is one thing that I would be using, Scikit-learn is another thing I would be using, NumPy, SciPy, these would all come with stuff because uh, a couple of these components depend on this particular thing. So then uh, our idea is that, uh, okay, now the next thing that comes in this process is that the developer typically wants to add more features to their application, right? So as a data scientist, maybe the next thing that you want to do is you want to plot your charts. Uh, you want to plot your charts, so data in those charts should look good. So these are two of your requirements. So what would you typically do? You would go to Google, you would uh, search a bunch of different things, you will add it some dependency, you would know, okay, what is this doing? Should I use it? Should I not use this? So that is the exact mapping plan to it over here. So we try to build a recommendation system that actually tries to understand your intention and also based on your stack, give you the best recommendation around which component you should be using. So in this case, yeah, the best component would be Matplotlib and Seaborn. All of us have used them. Matplotlib, the, I would say, undisputed best chart in library of Python. Seaborn makes the chart look better by magic. So those are the two things here. So initially, the attempt that we made to solve this problem when we were in our POC. So we were dealing with a very small set of data, I would say. So we started with your typical probabilistic graphical model based approaches and stuff. So if you know anything about PGMs, you know that every time a PGM does an inference, uh, the posterior of every single node is recalculated. So that means the inference times are actually higher than your trading times. And uh, as the size of your data increases, basically the recommendation times will increase because the number of nodes in your PGM will increase, the number of procedures you have to calculate increases. So it wasn't really working out. So if you work with hosted services, you know there's something called an SLA and something called an SLO. So if you take three seconds for a single recommendation, you're neither meeting your SLA nor your SLO. So everything lands up in a mess. So then what did you do? So if you remember the graph that we showed you at the beginning, NPM was the one that was the fastest growing ecosystem right now, with showing exponential growth compared to everybody else. So we thought, okay, let's target the hardest problem first. Now, when you tackle with something of this scale, right, 700,000 dependencies, I think there's 100, 2,000, uh, 1,000, 2,000 dependencies uploaded on there every day, then you're dealing with a very large data size. So, the time when we did this experiment, there were around 650,000 packages over there. A package is nothing but a dependency, of course. It has like 700,000 stacks per idea available. Okay. So, this size of the data was actually both a challenge and an opportunity, in that this was really, really rich data. All of the packages that are available on the NPM registry, they have very rich meta tags associated with them. So based on those tags, you can kind of figure out what this package does. 
So that's what I was thinking and uh, that got us exploring different fragmentation techniques. Uh, so the one that we formulated the original research on this uh, is uh, from Hong Kong University by a guy named Jopin Lee. Uh, we'll link to that in the uh, resources and you can read the word further. But uh, of course we modulated it to our it to our niche, which is what I'm talking about. So the biggest change that you had to do was that uh, how do we actually use this for our use case, right? So this x vector that you're seeing right here, uh, so I'll briefly go over the system itself. Uh, so the system is actually a combination of a variation autoencoder with a probabilistic matrix factorization element to it. So if you talk about probabilistic matrix factorization or any kind of matrix factorization in general, it's a purely collaborative approach. A collaborative approach means you're not taking any kind of item similarities into consideration. So when you're not taking any item similarities into consideration, what is the point of having all of that which data coming in from NPI? So for a hybrid recommendation approach, what this model essentially does is, is that we build a vocabulary out of all of the tags that we have got from the NPM registry and any dependency that we get, we have a way to encode it using that vocabulary to form this X vector. From this X vector, we actually get the latent space embeddings for this. Using those latent space embeddings, we actually train a probabilistic, uh, oh sorry, probabilistic negative factorization model. Uh, once we go through the code, this will be much more clear. Right, so the expected representation, uh, our modeling assumption, our biggest modeling assumption. So what is our assumption about? So let's say TensorFlow is a dependency, right? And it depends on NumPy and let's say TensorFlow. So the assumption was that any dependency that you get from the registry today for any kind of ecosystem, it will do either the things that it itself advertises that it does or maybe some additional functionality that would come in by way of its own dependency. So let's say there's TensorFlow, it also has some by other dependent. So TensorFlow doesn't explicitly, let's say, advertise that it also does linear algebra. But of course, if it's dependent on NumPy, this kind of low level ideas are generally exposed. So linear algebra would also be one of the things that would be exposed to TensorFlow. So based on that and our vocabulary, we form a representation. Uh, that's not technically one one one-off representation, it's uh, encoding that we did based on the vocabulary to get into our recommended system to actually train the neural network that you are seeing. And uh, now the next uh, thing in this uh, step was that, okay, what do you consider a user? So if I'm a user who uses TensorFlow to build a machine learning application, if I'm building front-end application tomorrow, TensorFlow isn't really the correct recommendation for me. So what we actually had to do was every single stack that we get into our platform today, we consider that a different user. Because every stack uh, is unique in terms of it being a unique user. So, before we go to the architecture and uh, how we kind of run and deploy this, uh, this kind of gives you a complete summary of uh, thinking behind this project. So we have the topics and the keywords from NPMJs coming in, the tags, the rich metadata that I was talking about, the list of packages first, and the items that need to be tagged, so the items that are actually need to be recommended. You do the encoding, you tag these, and you feed that to the variation order encoder to get the intermediate representations. Uh, so of course, once you train the variation order encoder, if you're aware, you get a mean and a variance parameter based on which you have to draw from a distribution. So that distribution, once you draw from it, you actually get an intermediate representation. You use that along with the manifest we are getting to actually a training probabilistic matrix factorization model. This, in turn, makes it from a pure collaborative approach to a more hybrid approach, where the item similarities are considered as well as the user item benefits. And of course, then the training model is ready to so I'll very quickly go over the training architecture for this thing. So if you talk about the training architecture, we use a combination of Amazon Web Services and uh, OpenShift, of course, to do the training. So in terms of the Amazon Web Services components we use, we use S3, of course, to store our data. We use Amazon's Elastic Properties because uh, we need a lot of compute and demand at certain times. And uh, basically what happens is, is that all of the data we have, uh, I'll come to the system, complete platform architecture at the end. But all of the data that lands up in S3, we load it to AMR, we go through the steps, which is the first training the variation order encoder, training the probabilistic matrix factorization piece, and of course it gets stored back to EDS, which is connected to the AMR thing, and we load it back to S3. And once it's in S3, then the magic of open check comes into the picture, which is, uh, of course, Kubernetes containers and the online units. So those are the scaling bits of this presentation, and those also we'll talk about later. So the user is actually dealing with the power of Kubernetes and its follow. So this is one of the sample recommendations uh, that uh, we talk about before we talk about evaluation first. So I'm not a big JavaScript guy, but Express is a very popular JavaScript framework, or means tag I think it's called. 
Mongoose is supposed to be an adapter that deals with MongoDB and stuff. So just a sign and check recommendation, MongoDB is coming out with one of the recommendations. And of course, the actual evaluation that we do. Great. So we worked with 29,000 dependencies when we did the initial experiment and uh, around 50,000 staff. So 50,000 stacks is 50,000 different users for us, 50,000 different user IDFS and 29,000 items to recommend. And of course, in the case of recommendation, recall is one of the best metrics to calculate. So number of items that you are recommending correctly. So we did the recall calculation at 350. And uh, to set up a baseline for this particular work, uh, we used the baseline that is from the original research as well, which is to actually train the auto encoder in a stack in a auto encoder fashion, which is also the pre-training step for our particular model. And uh, against, of course, the previous attempts using the PGM and everything, what kind of recall did we get? So on those metrics, uh, the recall at 300 score was 0.75 or 75%, uh, as it's written here. Uh, of course, I've rounded it down, but that's, of course, very good number. And the recall at 50, uh, that's also a solid 0.51, which is a 51% which is good. Uh, our main concerns, of course, uh, are related to our SLAs and SLOs, right? So if you can come down from 3 seconds for every recommendation to 300 milliseconds for every recommendation, uh, you're in a good place. I mean, you're looking at SLOs. And of course, because of the deep learning aspects of this and the matrix factorization aspects of this, the recommendation time doesn't really increase with the increase in size of the data, which actually enables us to build a greater learning factor for this later on. Uh, the training time, we, of course, because we use Amazon, we have access to all of the latest and greatest and deeper technology, so it's only about two hours on the 3.2 instances. This is back in January of last year. Now it's much faster, of course. Uh, so we will cover a little hands on of this particular model. Uh,
and then you can end it. Uh, so I will show that briefly. And of course, uh, this is just one of such layers. So this is the layer of training, and then you proceed to training the entire thing, and then the base was saved. And in the training of this, of course, you load from the pre-trained model itself, and from there you go into training both the matrix factorization bits and uh, the neural network, the variation of the bits. Uh, so. So if you go over here, I think you can briefly see this is there. So for the initialization of the neural network, of course, have an initialization if that's the standard right now. Uh, if I show you where you see the run function over here, uh, sorry, the fit function over here, which calls the run functions, the very first thing that we actually do is train layer wise. So every single layer is trained, all of our random layers are trained individually. Then we train the latent layer of this uh, autoencoder. So basically the layer which is supposed to give you the mean and the varying speeds. And uh, then we train the entire thing. And similar to this, uh, if you look at the actual model itself, which uh, follows from the pre-training model, of course the way we have pre-trained them, uh, that neural network is something we use to get our, uh, get our initial Transformations. Uh, yeah, but uh, I mean, you get the idea. So once you get the uh, transformations, those transformations uh, to the neural network, you feed them to to the, of course, the probabilistic matrix factorization training. Uh, so the way PNF is trained. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm sure a lot of you might be aware that already you calculate the likelihood and everything and you start with a normal prior and then you calculate the post like you do for any probability wave uh, So that's about that and uh, the last thing that I would touch upon is how we actually, yeah, so the next steps and the current work in this picture. So definitely we are working on a retraining pipeline like I talked about, an automated retraining pipeline. Also, an interesting thing over here is that not a lot of people give us explicit feedback. So, to collect implicit feedback, what we are actually starting to do is, when people code inside Visual Studio Code, right, if they act on our recommendations, those recommendations will start getting added to their stacks. So, if they are adding them to their stacks, you can start monitoring their stacks and actually figure out if they are getting acting on our recommendations. So, that way we are also getting implicit feedback loop on top of our, on top of our explicit feedback loop. So other models that we work on. So not everywhere is it the case that we get a lot of rich data. data. So Maven was one such uh, ecosystem and of course Python was one such ecosystem. And so then we use a very pure collaborative approach that's called higher tool pose and factorization and we did a very experiments with billion sets and perfect department. Everybody does that. So continuing on that, uh, now let's talk about the more interesting bits I guess, which is the scaling and the platform architecture of this. So so of course, this is the actual way Python is one platform. It's through uh, ES code extension. Being Red Hat, it's completely free and open source. You can contribute, you can use it, whatever. Uh, you can download it from over there. But uh, basically, we do this thing called a stack report. And uh, this is the very interesting architecture of the platform that is behind the stack report. So this is more of the client-facing architecture, but all of our components are kind of figured into it. So we have our recommendation models uh, service for the license stuff, the CDs that he was talking about and everything. All coming together into a backbone that deals with the API server which is balanced to a <coughs> SaaS that we call this case. It uh, does a lot of traffic control for us, which is a flow client. All of this is actually run on OpenShift, which is highly called tolerant and reliable and the whole nine yards and the rest of the stuff is AWS. So of course, all of our offline jobs run on AWS wherever, wherever we need a lot of compute. Uh, our central, I would say, lifeline is a graph data store that we have. Uh, so we use the dynamic review backend with a partial table box stack on top of it, which is, uh, yeah, which is, uh, Brendan is the query layer for that table box stack. Uh, the plugin itself is called Genius Graph. Uh, so the Pondons work, which is currently being used internally, if it ever becomes a public facing thing, uh, we'll integrate it as one of the many tweets that we actually collect in the platform. So all of the external CV feeds such as NVD are not currently exposed to everybody else, but this work, the probable CV as well, would we'll start coming into the system soon. Uh, technologies that we use for scaling of course AWS, uh, OpenShift, uh, so if you guys are aware of Kubernetes, Kubernetes is a more of a, I would say, platform. Uh, Red Hat OpenShift is Red Hat's distribution of Kubernetes. 
which is built around uh, uh, the idea of an application platform built around Kubernetes. So it gives you all the magic of Kubernetes with uh, a more user, uh, I would say, tolerable interface and everything. It's e easier to do stuff over there. And of course, containers. So containers are something most people popularly know as Docker, but uh, Docker is not the only kind of container in this world right now. Uh, there is this entire open containers initiative, and there is a set specification. There are other tools as well, Builda and uh, and stuff which you can actually use to build containers. Uh, so inside Kubernetes and OpenShift right now, Prio is the, the I would say a container and time of choice. Uh, so of course, uh, Kubernetes, uh, the, uh, the advantages that it gives us is that it's in the load balancing, it's an application for storage and everything. And uh, I guess I have some time left. So uh, the more interesting thing I can show you over here is uh, the actual templates that we need to write to get this through. So I'm sure many of you must have already seen a docker file at some point, but uh, if you have not, uh, this is kind of what you use to build something called an image. So this uh, might be looking quite complex, but it's really nothing. It's a bunch of shell commands that you do, that you attach to something called docker directives. All of these directives together make what is called an image. So an image is basically a, a container or an image. Uh, so image has a lot of containers, uh, but uh, not to be pedantic about that. An image is basically a complete reproducible copy of everything that you uh, package into that container. And uh, once you have a container, the question becomes how do you actually run that container. So that is where Kubernetes comes into the picture. So everything you need to do with actually running your container, that is what Kubernetes helps you with. So this is a template that actually requires quite a bit of background to write, but just to go over it briefly. Uh, so in our case, what we wanted was multiple replicas. So you can either create a pod config or a deployment config. What we created is something called a deployment config. Deployment config actually has something called a replica. So you can tell Kubernetes or OpenShift in this case that okay, I always want five available replicas of my application and it's going to manage that for me. So yeah, that is one of the aspects. And uh, you include that along with that, all of the other details of how to actually run this container. So based on that, you create something called config maps, you create secrets, uh, there's a whole bunch of things. Uh, and uh, otherwise, yeah, so that is that about Kubernetes. Uh, so there is a lot of theory around this, uh, but it's basically one of the ways to actually access the Kubernetes APIs. So you can access the APIs directly through HTTP requests. You can, I think there is also a JSON API available for this. But if you guys have SRE in your company, this uh, YAML model is technically generally what they use and it's the one that you should be using because it would enable you as developers to actually deploy your own model onto OpenShift or Kubernetes or whatever your company is using. And uh, it's a very difficult thing to set up, but once the setup is done, it's very easy to manage your models in production. So that's where the good parts are. So uh, something like a scenario where you have very heavy load, you can just scale up the replicas, you have very less load, you can scale down the replicas, there's an auto-scaler so it can take care of scaling for you, there's load balancing and everything. So that is the very interesting work that we do around deployment. And uh, coming back to the presentation for a bit. Yeah, so all of these services that you see that we are actually running on OpenShift, they all have these kind of templates for them. All of our models that we run on OpenShift, they have these kind of templates for them. So this entire architecture that you see, it's actually has the capacity to scale itself on the load. So every time we see a lot of traffic coming in over here, all of this has a capability to start scaling as long as you just give it the necessary infrastructure, which of course with AWS is something you can get on demand. And uh, the detail and detail jobs are something that we've currently started. So we are doing this in that project where we are actually automating the training of all our models. Uh, the Ponzi's model, once it's ready, it's going to be a part of that. Uh, yeah. And uh, I guess that's it for the talk and uh, if you guys like it, you guys want to contribute, we are on the look for building a community around our thing and of course as a red hat, we are always open to external contributions and stuff. So, thank uh, you. And also the idea is like you guys are building these machine learning or deep learning models, you can uh, potentially, let's say once you build a web service, you use something like Docker to dockerize it so that you can deploy it anywhere, you don't have to worry about the OS, the dependencies and all that. And you can use Kubernetes where you can scale up your applications also. So these are some things to keep in mind as you guys, let's say, want to work on bigger data sets and serve more and more customers and all that. So.